forensic science, which I think is going to be a really interesting topic. So it's free, just like this one. So again, Friday the 26th, 730, uh, in Sierra Hall in room 132. Okay, the Great Valley Museum. How many of you have been there? Okay. You realize that student is free for you. And right here in the building, right you can. And uh, right now, our current exhibit is on Homo Naledi, a really interesting hominid, a professor of anthropology. She's involved in this re very fascinating research. So if you get a chance, it's coming here throughout the summer. So I highly recommend stopping by to see that. And then finally, where these our classes, are not talks that we have scheduled for the fall. Some details are still being worked out, but you can see what our topics are, our speakers. Um, the first one will be dealing with muscles. The second one, for all of you pre-nursing students, we're having developing a new nursing program at LBN. And so we have a speaker from LI Health on that. We're going to have somebody from Fish Bio, and she'll be talking about Fish Bio careers, what they do. Uh, a NASA ambassador will be talking about citizen scientists, where you can help be involved in all kinds of many different projects that are available for citizen scientists. Uh, and then we have somebody, in this one I'm really excited about, someone from the Little Guy Wine Great Commission. You can tell I like wine. So, so that one's going to be a really good one. And then you want to, you want to talk about the last one? Because there'll be uh, four student teams that are going to be researching as part of a new mini grant. We have um, like uh, topics related to the circular bioeconomy and bio industries in Stanislaus County. So that will be an interesting one as well. And I think you want to talk about the health. Yeah, so a lot of you are are here you're in health, different health careers. If you haven't gone by already, right now happening from two to six p.m. is the health programs fair right next door in the Great Valley Museum. You'll see lots of signs about it. Um, so there's a lot of representatives from different programs related to to fields related to like nursing, respiratory care, veterinary care. Um, social work, so things that you might be interested in uh, checking out that visit. Um, and then without further ado, I would like to uh, welcome our guest from the Stanislaus Valley Street uh, Harm Reduction Program. And I'll ask each of them to introduce themselves. I'm really excited to be here with them today. I think they bring a lot of energy and passion and optimism to a topic that can feel really heavy and really personal to a lot of us. So um, thank you all for being here. And uh, thank you guys for coming. Thanks for having me. Thank you guys so much for having us. Um, I guess this is not a microphone, but this is sort of like there's a YouTube like channel that's I guess being recorded. So I have to kind of like awkwardly hold this. Um, thank you guys really so much for you know hosting us. We do this work every day. We'll kind of dive into a little bit of the different avenues that we do, addiction medicine, harm reduction, street medicine, um, and hopefully show that, you know, we come from different backgrounds, different educational backgrounds, um, but have really come together to form a really exciting, fun team uh, in the Valley to help people with substance use disorder or just people who are just using drugs or substances in general. Um, it's very timely. We've got Coachella coming up this weekend. So if anyone needs uh, fentanyl test strips or some Narcan, I've already been doing the rounds today, dropping some off to people. So please like reach out to us so that, you know, you guys can test your substances and then carry a bunch of Narcan. We have some uh, Narcan keychains that we brought too for people to come with like little face masks. Um, but you got to be slow. We don't have a ton. So um, I didn't expect such a big crowd. I know. Yeah, this is really this is really exciting, actually. So, um, you know, I, we're going to get to introducing ourselves in just a second. It's, I think, the next slide. But we like to sort of start out with um, a Martin Luther King Jr. quote, usually because it is, you know, it's always so timely, even though these words were spoken a long time ago. Um, but this is something that we think about a lot. Um, so make a career of humanity. Commit yourself to the noble struggle for equal rights. You will make a better person of yourself, a greater nation of your country, and a finer world to live in. So we think about things like this all the time in our work. So this is us. Um, 
I guess I'll just start since I'm already holding this microphone thing. Um, but I am uh, Dr. Andy Silva. I'm a family medicine doctor as well as an addiction specialist. So I grew up in the Valley, born and raised in Fresno, uh, left as soon as I could, right? Right, went to UC Davis. I was like still in the Valley. Um, traveled all over, worked at UCSF, and I can hardly believe I'm back in the Valley. It's like this, it's so crazy to me, but um, I'm loving it. We all know it's very underserved. And so it's the perfect place for us to have started our nonprofit organization, the Addiction Centers of Excellence, which also, of course, hosts our street medicine team, the Valley Streets Harm Reduction Program. Wonderful. Hey, thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting us today. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm James Kraus, the other co-founder and co-president of this, and my claim to fame is that um, I brought Andy back to the Central Valley from yes. Boston, yeah. and yeah. so uh, I know we're all happy about that because of the great work <laughs> that they're doing. So, um, yeah, I'm not from the Central Valley, but all my kids are, so I got four kids here in various stages of high school and college and under and elementary school. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I grew up in South Carolina and did my medical school in Oklahoma, landed out here, practiced for about 10 years on and off in West Africa before I came back to join um, uh, teaching faculty for family medicine. I'm also now addiction medicine board certified as a specialist. So that's a little bit about me. Hello, um, thank you guys so much for joining us. I'm super excited to see a packed room. I was not expecting this. Um, my name is Alexa Ortega. I am the Director of Harm Reduction Services for Valley Streets, which is our harm reduction program. Um, my background is subjectively anticlimactic compared to theirs, but um, I was born here in Modesto. I've been here my whole life, uh, never left. And to be fair, I never really wanted to leave. Um, I, you know, this is this is my this is my my stomping grounds, and this is where I feel most comfortable. And what I've learned is that um, home is not only where you make it, but what you make it. Right. So I've gotten to pour a lot of love into this city, and um, now we get to enjoy the fruits of our labor, labor connecting with people that are underserved, very marginalized, um, often overlooked. Um, but you know, I met these two just doing street outreach. Um, Essentially, we were part of this, Dr. Kraus and I were part of a, a coalition that met monthly to discuss um, uh, overdose, overdose deaths and data. And through that work, connecting with him, I eventually met Dr. Silva. So now we are um, a trio. We make up Valley Streets and the ACE Foundation. And um, yeah, I think that covers it, right? Yeah. Excited to dive into our work. Yeah, let's dive in. But I do have a question first. Um, students, everybody, mostly everybody, student, um, allied health. Are you in allied health pre-nursing? Is that what most people here are for? A lot of people are any basic science people or pre other things or undecideds probably going along there. So we, um, yeah, we do want to speak to especially our, our, our allied health and, and pre-medical pre-nursing, uh, students and, um, share with you our vision of what care really does look like, the humanizing aspects of care, because I'll have to be very honest with you. Part of the reason we start out with something very philosophical and our core values is that medicine and the training in medicine, whether it's nursing or a physician or whatever, has a way of squeezing the humanity out of you. I don't know what it is in the training process, but at least when I experienced it. And coming back and doing street medicine and uh, doing what I consider real medicine has brought the humanity back into my practice and in my life. And so um, if you're looking forward to that and you're idealistic and you're like, I'm going to be a great whatever, a respiratory tech or a nurse, and I'm going to really treat my patients and with compassion. And then you find yourself four years into that thinking that they're another number or I wish so-and-so wouldn't be here. Um, there is light at the end of that tunnel and there is hope and there is a different way of practicing that and a different way of treating other people that I think our street medicine and our um, addiction care can really bring out. So we would be available afterwards for questions and talking if anybody has any of those, but mm -hmm. I'm gonna hand this over to. Yeah, that was, that was really well said. And there are opportunities to have students and trainees come out with us. Uh, that's a big part of our program is right now we're hosting family medicine residents. Um, however, we want to expand that. So any students, like-minded people who want to come out and do some good work, we, uh, we would love to have you. So core values, just wanted to throw them up there. This is who we are. Um, you know, I think it's important to just have you guys know, you know, who we are, like, what are, 
what do we represent? So inclusion, safety, community, equity, advocacy, and evidence-based. Hopefully these come through uh, our talk. So as a nonprofit, I just wanted to throw this up there because we do a lot of stuff. You know, we're very new. We've been doing this nonprofit, the ACE Foundation, for the last year and a half. And we're trying to touch a lot of areas in the community, really most of the Central Valley. So this is sort of just a broad scope of what we can do. This is actually us outside of the Pride Center, so Mo Pride, um, where we do some free HIV, Hep C, and syphilis testing and treat people actually directly right there for syphilis. So um, that's just one of, for instance, our outpatient um, things that we do. Um, as far as inpatient, I also wanted to talk about how our addiction medicine services actually also happen at Doctors Medical Center. So we're always trying, we want to build this program up. Currently right now we do uh, consults. So someone says, hey, my patient's here for an infection in the leg, but now they're starting to seem really anxious. They wanna leave, they're being really mean, right? You know, sort of putting it on the patient. We say, oh, okay, well, you know, could they be withdrawing from something? So we've been getting a lot of patients on Suboxone, Methadone, you know, evidence-based treatments for substance use disorder in the hospital setting. It's a perfect touch point. People are usually in a really bad way and sometimes want to change. If not, it at least gives us a time to sort of make the human connection with them and let them know that we care. Uh, we're never trying to push treatment on anybody, but if they want it, great, we're there. Uh, so that's something that's been really fun, and we're going to be building that over the next uh, year as well, so um, with social workers and case managers and whatnot. Okay, so we are going to make this kind of panel style. Um, so I'm going to start by asking the questions, and I'm going to have these lovely uh, folks attempt to answer them in your own words. Uh, they did get a little bit of preview time yesterday, so maybe you, hopefully you've come up with something pretty good. Uh, this is actually, and I'll say too, this is actually Dr. Krause's daughter. Uh, she originally started out with us, right? So she's a first year in college. So pretty cool, the different levels of people that we have out with us and just can add so much uh, to the program. But this is us out just, you know, walking the streets and taking care of people. Uh, so question one, uh, can either one of you or both of you please discuss any innovative approaches you have implemented to address the unique challenges faced by people who use drugs and those experiencing unsheltered homelessness? Me. Oh, <laughs> yes, Alexa. Um, so. I like this question a lot. Um, some of the innovative approaches we use uh, in a nutshell are street medicine. Have, has anyone ever heard of street medicine? Nice. Okay, so street medicine is, <laughs> that's good. Yeah, so street medicine is not like mobile medicine, right? There are lots and lots of mobile services for people who need them, who are marginalized, underserved, and that's great. But um, the issue that the issue that comes about with mobile services is that they're not going exactly where the people who need the services are where those people need them, right? And part of our work includes this, this idea that um, we get to meet people exactly where they're at, not where we want them to be. Um, so what that looks like for us is going into alleys, camps, like we're in the trenches doing our work, right? Um, and we love it because it requires a lot of trust, a lot of patience, because before that trust comes, we have to spend lots of time rapport building, right? So this approach, what it enables us to do is provide the care that the mobile services tend to be um, somewhat ineffective providing just because the approach isn't as sufficient, right? So we found that with street medicine, going directly to the folks who need the care, um, like I said, it allows us to bridge that gap between them and the medical system, really just through rapport building and trust. Um, let me see, what was it? What are the inner, inner innovations do you have to talk about? Innovations, gosh. Things like, that we are gonna do. Things that we are gonna do. There's so many. There's, so There's a lot. I don't even know where to start, so I'll pass it to Dr. Krauss. <laughs> Yay, I get to talk. I actually want to hear from y'all, but I guess I have to talk first. Um, that's my Southern roots coming out, by the way. I said y'all. Um, great, innovations, bringing treatment straight to people, doing addiction medicine, and doing all, everything that you can do in a primary care office on the street, right? Um, bringing medications to patients, offering uh, lockers, to people who are unhoused who can't safely maintain their medicines, right? Actually, all the innovations are related to what is it like to experience homelessness. I won't ask if anybody here has experienced uh, being unhoused or homeless, um, but who can with their imagination come up with some ideas of some barriers to, I don't know, you probably have seen a doctor at some point in your life, right? 
you had to go through a lot of steps to get there and finally get the doctor and get the treatment and or whatever you needed. What barriers do you imagine are faced by people who are experiencing um, unhoused and uh, um, being unsheltered homelessness right now? Anybody? Transportation is a big one. So some of the innovation is really around transportation. It's like doing a home visit at a tent, maybe bringing somebody to another appointment that they may have or to the pharmacy if they need to go. What other things? Money. Money is a really big deal. Appropriate attire. Right. So what does that mean? Expand on that. Private bits. The private bits, okay. So, and why would that be a barrier to getting medical care like most of us in here usually do? Mm -hmm. What if you have enough to cover, but it's not clean and it smells bad? It could be embarrassing. So shame is a, is a part of that, right? Um, have you ever noticed somebody who's been shamed by what they wear? How do they feel? Have you ever been that? I won't ask personal stories, please. But you probably would avoid a situation where you feel like you're going to be shamed publicly or embarrassed. Other barriers, we had money, we had transportation, we had um, shame-based things. Let's, let's run with that. Anybody else? Anybody? Child. Bueller? Child care? Yeah. What about not just a child, but a pet? How many people who are experiencing, and by the way, does anybody know how many people roughly in Stanislaus County there are who are unsheltered right now? Any guesses? Just throw out a number. Somebody said 500? 500,000. That's more than the population of the county. <laughs> Great. I love it. Anybody? 200,000 unsheltered people in a city of 150,000 or 300,000. No. I mean, you guys are... It's visible. It's a big issue. It's in the paper. It's everything. But it's it's roughly about 2,500, I think, mm -hmm. right now. The most recent point in time count. Most recent 3, point in time. 3,000. Um, and most doctors will have about 2,000 people that they follow if they're working full time. So there's a lot of people who are unserved. Most of those people who are unsheltered are not going to go to a doctor for the reasons that we are. And there's good data to back that up roughly 90%, 95 won't have a primary care doctor. So we bring the primary care to them. Any other barriers? Food? Exactly. So what is it about food that's a barrier to getting care? What is it about food that's a barrier to getting health care? That's a barrier to good health. I totally agree with you on that. But why would food actually be a barrier to getting to the doctor? More concerned about getting food. Yeah. How are you going to get fed today? A lot of times that requires a lot of walking, maybe some panhandling, maybe finding something, something else. Addiction. addiction. What is it about addiction? Thank you for bringing that elephant in the room up that in, that stops people from getting care at the doctor's office. Getting drugs, right? What else relates to the person next to you here who said not, you know what I mean? Yeah. What do we call that? And what do we call that when it's system-wide? Stigma. Okay. You guys have heard of stigma. You can add a barrier that... Yeah, yeah. So this was, doing, doing great. yeah. so this was something I didn't even realize until we started doing the work, right? So another huge barrier is, okay, we're doing street medicine. We get there, right? We, right ex geographically, location-wise, where they need us, right? And their space, not ours. Um, they're seen. The meds are called in. Great. So we get to provide a services as it allows where we go to get their meds, right? Um, well, a lot of the time we can't because some pharmacies require verification of contact information. So when you are unhoused, you might have, um, so the information that gets requested from us when we go attempt to pick up meds for um, our program participants include um, a social, that's usually easy to verify, but um, the hard ones are address and phone number. If you're unhoused, you don't have an address. And when you're unhoused, if you have a phone, it's likely that that's not your long-term phone, just because all the nuances of being unhoused, right? Your things get stolen, your things break, you get arrested, now your phone's in property, you're probably not going to get it back, because why would you go back to the police department to get your property back? You've already been victimized by, the, by those agencies, right? So... Just as simple as someone not having a, or even just remembering what the previous 
the previous address or phone number on file with that specific pharmacy was, it stifles us. It stifles them from getting the meds that they need, right? So even if we can get them, even if we think we're getting them to that finish line, it's quite hard to cross. Great. So uh, yeah, you want to talk about some of the innovations around those? Sure, sure. So uh, so this is to be really specific about some of the innovations that we've taken. Um, I love these like generally being innovative by being a good human and not stigmatizing patients. It's like sort of incredible that that's an innovation, right, in the healthcare field, but it is. Um, so some of, some of our innovations that we do, actually in the far left here, this is our Stanislaus County public health team. They come out with us um, during our street medicine days, and they are the ones that actually provide the rapid testing kits. And they do the rapid testing. So this is HIV, hepatitis C, syphilis. They bring the penicillins. So I'm just like shooting people up with penicillin all day long. Uh, so they bring... There's a lot of syphilis out there. So they bring that team. Um, this is actually, I think this is the MJC. Yeah, this was an MJC event the, or the one pill can kill event. It's the run, yeah, the 5K. Yeah. Another innovation is uh, top right up there. That was uh, that was Porch Fest. We didn't even sort of plan it. And we just kind of, you know, decided to hand out Narcan and fentanyl test strips. Amazing how many people came by. And cookies. And cookies as well. Um, does anybody know what's what the bottom right... We know the bottom right, the bottom right. Yeah, the bottom right photo is. Does anybody can anybody describe what that is? A piece of foil. 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 And foil. What do you think it was being used for? Why is that smoke significant? Heroin. To smoke heroin. Now in this now in this community, all the heroin is fentanyl at this point. There's no heroin left. If you have heroin, that would be almost like very unusual. But this is the main way that people are using fentanyl in this county actually across the country is smoking fentanyl. And so I bring this up because there's this thought that people can go around and accidentally come in contact with fentanyl and die. And that is incorrect. So a big innovation that we do is trying to educate people on the evidence out there, which is, I mean, we don't even normally wear gloves just in like solidarity. But uh, but we do pick up a lot of foil, we pick up a lot of sharps, a lot of points, needles, glass pipes and things of that sort. Um, but educating the community that, hey, you know, people are spending all day touching fentanyl and they're not dying from that accidental exposure and touching it. You know, fentanyl patches for medicine took years and years and years to create so that it could be slapped on the skin and actually sort of pass those barriers transdermally. Um, so that's a big intervention is really trying to get the right science and the right evidence out to people, because it's sort of incredible how even, you know, doctors and healthcare providers um, can be potentially propagating incorrect information. Can I add something? To Please. That? So along with picking up, um, along with picking up the discarded ingestion tools like foil needles, um, we call them tutors, which are usually like straws or hollowed out pens used to smoke off a of foil. Um, there have been plenty, like actually a surprising amount of times where we have either come across a baggie with like a substance in it or been called to go pick it up, which is actually really fun for us because we have all the proper tools to maintain safety concerns, right, and protect our own safety, but also adequately dispose of those substances. So we have tested many, many, many batches of drugs. And I say that because a lot of people, um, it's, it's really hard to disarm the argument that's been really ingrained into our minds, like fentanyl bad, fentanyl dangerous, fentanyl equals death. Um, kind of, but there's a path there, right? There's a lot of things in between before you get to that death part. Um, so that's just to say, some people would argue, well, that's just residue. So how could it hurt you? Um, residue is not going to hurt you. But additionally, we have tested many, many, many batches of live substances that have come back positive for fentanyl. We've run so many tests. Um, and as you can see, we've, we're all still standing quite healthy, quite well and alive. Um, and yeah, as Dr. Silva said, we, in solidarity, it's quite, uh, we usually do forego the gloves, right? Um, but additionally, Sharps tend to scare people, but it's as easy as our common sense would allow us to make it, right? Don't grab it by the needle. Grab it by the plunger. If you have a sleeve, like, grab it with your sleeve. Um, and don't ever throw them in the garbage. You guys can call us to come get sharps if you have them. Okay. I put this question second because I wanted to make sure we absolutely got to it. Um, so... But before that, I will say, so, and this is us actually at the Salvation Army. So the last Saturday of every month, the Vituity Health, which staffs the emergency room at Doctors Medical Center, Golden Valley Urgent Care, you know, they have a big team of nurses and, and physicians assistants and whatnot. Uh, they 
put this clinic on the last Saturday of every month at the Salvation Army, and it's run by the Substance Use Navigator at Doctors Medical Center, who's a really good friend of ours. And so we get the job. Substance Use Navigator. It is. It is. Great job, actually. It's a, it's a great job connecting people to services, again, using your communication skills and rapport building. Um, so just another avenue that you can think about is, you know, where could I see myself doing some work? You know, the Salvation Army has some clinics. We're trying to build those up. But, you know, even coming out and volunteering the last Saturday of every month is a cool opportunity. Um, OK, so question two, in what ways does harm reduction play a role in your work with people who use substances? And what training can you recommend for others to learn more about harm reduction principles? Oh, here we go. Yeah, uh, you give me that. You're just going to fight over that one. We're going to fight over because this is our favorite thing. This is uh, um, something I think, uh, let's ask the question first. What's harm reduction? When we say that, what do we mean? And it looks different for everybody. So there really is no wrong answer. There's no wrong answer. What do we mean? What do you mean? Does anybody have any idea what the hell I'm talking about? Do you want to Google it real quick? What was that? Reducing drug use. Reducing drug use. Can, look like that. Can look like that. What else? Reducing how? Okay. Mm -hmm. Using safely. Okay. Um, a needle exchange. Who's here has heard of a needle exchange, right? You guys have heard of a needle exchange? I won't ask what your general feeling about that is, but a needle exchange is one end of harm reduction. Um, other harm reduction ideas that are out there. Who here uh, puts on sunscreen before they go out in the sun? Right? Who here wears a seatbelt? If you're out on a bicycle and you're riding a bike, do you put a helmet on? If you're on a motorcycle, do you put a helmet on? Why is that harm reduction? You're doing a risky thing and you're reducing the risk of harm to yourself, right? We do risky things all the time and we do, we have technologies and other behaviors that help us reduce the risk and the harm to ourselves when we do those. I mean, look at me. The sun damages me if I spend five minutes in it. So I put on sunscreen versus not go outside. Reducing use, reducing my exposure to the sun is also uh, a great idea to reduce harm to myself. Other harm reduction, um, condoms, right? People are gonna have sex. How about designated drivers? Mm -hmm. So what amount of alcohol is a safe amount of alcohol? Anybody? Hmm? Anybody? Zero, who said zero? Zero is correct. Okay, so the, the safest amount of alcohol is zero, but I mean, we just, your professor was up here talking about how she loves to drink wine, right? <laughs> not you, not you. But her professor was up here just talking about drinking wine, right? And she goes out and drinks, what's a harm reduction thing to do? Moderate the amount. And, if you, and whether or not you moderate, have a designated driver. That is all harm reduction. So what somebody up here said, using safely. Um, I'm going to pass that on to you guys to, so that we can describe what we do. So I want to before. Yeah. So as far as using safely. Um, before getting into what we do, you know, something I learned very early on um, was that the, the very, 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 very first responders to any overdose are people who are using drugs. Right. Um, we've been taught that like birds of a feather flock together. So naturally. Um, when someone is using drugs, they tend to be with other people who are using drugs, and that's fine. That's actually their safest bet. One, because of the stigma that comes along with using drugs, right? Um, you're with people who aren't going to judge you. You're with people you feel mostly safe with. Um, and additionally, if you overdose, you know, we have... How, how many of you have not heard of Narcan? Yeah. Have not? Okay, great. So we, we get to pass out a boatload of Narcan, right? And um, if I'm falling out, I'm not going to be able to Narcan myself, but if there's a chance I do, then I probably don't need it. So Narcan is not for you. It's for the person beside you or the person you're going to cross paths with in the park, in the parking lot, right? Um, in any case, using safely, for me, I would say, like, what we what we get to do is always encourage people to never use alone, ever. Um, we don't have the number. I don't think we have the number for the never use alone hotline in the slide, huh? No, but it's very Googleable. It's very Googleable, yes. Um, harm reduction is not a very original idea. It's been done for decades, right? So as, as a country, we're actually quite behind, but that's just to say there is a hotline um, that's called Never Use Alone. As Dr. Silva said, it's quite Googleable. And um, someone literally picks up the phone and like sits on there with you until 
you're you're done using, right? They get like your your vital information. Your, you, I don't even think they really ask a name, but they definitely get your location, right? So they can call first responders if you are alone and you're not responding to them on the phone. Um, using safely for us requires access to sterile needles, right? I'll pull some of this out as you're talking. Oh yeah, we have a lot of fun goodies to pass around if you guys wanna see. Um, sterile needles, um, fentanyl test kits, right? Why would somebody use a fentanyl test kit? We can get honest. What what would have fentanyl in it if it's not fentanyl? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Cocaine. Cocaine. Crank. 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 Yep. Edibles. Heroin. Heroin, Heroin could also have fentanyl in it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. How about the Xanax that somebody gets off the street because they're stressed out about their exam? The Xanax they get off the street because they're stressed about their exam and they just need to sleep the night before. That has definitely happened. The Adderall from the street. The Adderall from the street, because I want to focus on my studies. I'm trying to make this very relevant to y'all. Um, uh, I don't see a lot of edibles contaminated, but I do see a lot of street Xanax, street Adderall, street Oxys, street Vicodin. They're all easy to test. If somebody, one of you or anybody, decides that they want to use this thing that they've purchased or obtained somehow, or a friend gave them, it's very easy. You have a test. Yeah. And so I just want to say that, you know, these are when I was mentioning, if you want to come and get these from us, then this is what you would get. So it's from a really cool company called Dance Safe. And they actually do specialize in getting test strips out for people who, you know, experience like sort of more of like the EDM scene or like the Coachella's like, you know, festival scenes or clubs and bars, or clubs and things of that sort. And, and we do drop off a lot of this stuff at some of the local bars. We've done mm -hmm. some trainings for them, but you would get basically an instruction book. And this tells you exactly how to test your substances because there can be false positives and false negatives. The last thing you want is a false negative and you say, great, there's no fentanyl in that. And then you use it. So, you know, you want to be pretty specific. And so in order to do that and keep it accurate, they all come with a tiny little microscope so that you know exactly how much of the substance to measure out. They usually come with a little cup and a little bit of water as well. And then you simply just take your fentanyl test strip, you open the sucker up, you dip it in your substance, lay it out, and it'll tell you it's either going to have one line, which is positive for fentanyl, fentanyl, or two lines for party time. So that's what you're looking for. It's like two lines, party time, mm -hmm. otherwise one line for fentanyl. And um, we just got access to 10,000 of these from the state. Yeah. So we have plenty. I have just recently admitted somebody who was snorting cocaine at a party who had an overdose of fentanyl. I've had people use Xanaxes, overdose from fentanyl, and MDMA. FYI. I mean, if you're going to go have a good time, please do it safely. Do you have Natalie, a question? I have a question. I just want to say that we also have fentanyl test strips in Narcan and health services on both campuses and in our brand new vending, well, wellness Ooh, vending. Oh, very good. Dude, they beat vending us to the vending health. machine. Ooh. That's for free, I can. For free, yeah. And all of these supplies should absolutely be free. Do not ever pay for Narcan at the pharmacy. Um, it's very expensive. When I started doing this work, I had to pay what I'll call, you know, MSRP, the market value, which is about $140 for a single box. Um, now you get it over the counter for about 50, but that's still too much. It's it's accessible for free. It's available for free. Um, and it's great to know that you guys even have it here on campus. That's awesome. That's great. Where are these vending machines? Uh, both libraries. Both libraries. That's so cool. Go find it. Yeah. All right. What else? What other safe use supplies? The other thing I wanted to say is we get it all the time, the argument against harm reduction. And it's sort of that, you know, all we do are a bunch of needles and pipes because we do pipes as well. Does anybody know specifically why we even hand out sterile needles and we're works with your tourniquets, alcohol swabs, and why we would even hand out glass pipes to people. Anyway. They're going to do it anyway. Do it. Okay. okay. Yes. In the LA hat. The, to reduce the uh, risk of infection, disease. Bingo. That's, that's huge. HIV, hep C, COVID, right? <laughs> I love that. I love that. We should have been throwing these out. <laughs> That's awesome. She got a specialty pink one as well. So 
what I will say is something that I didn't realize would come about from handing out stuff like this is that you build so much rapport with your patients and they immediately know that you don't judge them. And I say it all the time, but pipes lead to paps as in pap smears. So you're starting to, you know, see patients, you talk to them, you hand them a pipe because they're using methamphetamine and they know that you care about them. You know, I don't want you to get HIV or hepatitis C you're using and you're not ready to stop. Maybe you never stop because some people use methamphetamine to stay up when they're unhoused and they're women because they will be sort of molested or bothered at nighttime. There's a lot of reasons people use substances. And, and again, you know, this little dinky little glass pipe, which is provided by the state of California, has really opened a lot of doors to patients that normally would not get any care. And so I just wanted to put that out there because, you know, harm reduction is absolutely needles and Narcan and pipes, but it's also just treating people with dignity, respect, and, and really understanding that people have their own autonomy to make their own decisions about their body and how they live. You mentioned it was evidence-based. And it's evidence-based for the last 30 years. We have solid data that's should be impossible to ignore. <laughs> okay, so let's move aside. Let's move along. Move aside. <laughs> uh, I threw these on here because I thought this gave a really good picture. I wanted you to talk about this just briefly. Okay. Yeah. Um. So. Yeah, I've been a harm reductionist for this year makes nine years. Um, and these are you know so. I, I kind of touched on it a, a couple minutes ago. Um, I was buying Narcan out of pocket to distribute when I was cleaning up essentially needles. I was just picking up needles and foil. Um, and again, placing myself in those environments, I would meet people who needed the Narcan, right? So as I gained access to Narcan, um, I was able to give it out at way higher volumes. And these are a couple of messages um, I've gotten from people who um, were able to use the Narcan um, the first message, it says, hey, girl, I just wanted to say thanks again for everything that you do in handing out Narcan. The last one I got from you saved my dad's life yesterday. It breaks my heart that it had to be used, but I'm thankful I had it hidden somewhere. Um, he's in the ICU and just got off the ventilator. Also, something to note about this individual, we worked together at a hospital. We worked together at a hospital. Um, but again, even though Narcan, I would say now it's obviously more available and accessible. Just because something's available doesn't make it accessible, right? Um, but at that point in time, um, like there was no substance use navigator. This was only about a year ago. There was no substance use navigator in that hospital. So the other message um, is from another friend of mine who um, got quite a bit, quite a few uh, units of Narcan from me for her, for a former partner of hers who was struggling with his substance use. Um, and this was one, a message from her, but actually on two occasions, the Narcan she was able to obtain because of open access with no barriers, no price tag. Um, it, it's, it saved his life. It saved her former partner's life. Um, yep. A dead person can't recover from drug use or alcohol use. Right. And, you know, I just really want to. So one thing that we keep at the forefront of our work is the idea that absolutely nobody deserves to die because they use drugs. Right. So if you're thinking about going into healthcare, it's so important for you to realize this is a tolerance you're going to have to have and build. Um, and it's just a certain level of compassion and understanding and humanity. You're going to be you're going to have to be willing to propagate and, and, and keep um, exhibiting for your patients. Right. Um, and then these are just some pictures of of cleanup that, you know, I, I, we've done. So my very friend <laughs> when I was. When I started picking up needles, I all I had was like a an antifreeze um, container, and so <laughs> yeah. Now now we have like these really beautiful legitimate um, sharps containers, but I had to be resourceful. So um, these are all picked up off canals and parks. Um, this was in an alleyway. It was so ironic because there's needles, there's a pill bottle, a knife, and then there's like a Modesto police resources list, right? Um, this is an example. Yeah. The orange, caps. the orange caps. Yeah. So the orange caps, we, we do a lot of cleanup. Um, and we all, you know, I also, I want to get back to the street medicine, th uh, the portion of our work. We have um, program participants who have diabetes and just don't know how to properly dispose of their, um, their um, home generated sharps. 
So we offer that service as well. It's not just about substance use, right? We get to create um, access for people who are who are using um, drugs to use safely, but we definitely expand um, into you know the normal medical care. Yeah. Beautiful. So question three. Um, I love the word intersectionality. So I was really excited to be able to include it in pretty much every presentation I do. So how do you address either one of you, uh, the intersectionality of substance use disorder, homelessness and marginalized identities such as race, gender, sexuality in your approach to care? Want to take that one, Andy? I can take this one. Um, so one thing I know Alexa was just mentioning about patients who have diabetes and how we do sort of some cleanup of needles and whatnot that they have, but what I'm particularly passionate about is the intersection of gender affirming hormone therapy. So someone who has gender dysphoria, they're sort of maybe assigned male at birth, but really feel strongly that they're a female and a woman. And so perhaps they're using hormones, perhaps not. Um, but our needle exchange also provides the specific needles that people need to give themselves hormones, whether it's estrogen or testosterone. They're vastly different than the needle you would use to inject drugs. They're much larger. Um, so they're they're different. Um, so we like to think that, you know, people are actually using needles for other reasons and we're collecting sharps for other reasons. So one thing that I'm really excited that we do is we do post up at uh, the Mo Pride Center. So you saw the little picture of us doing some rapid testing, uh, but we also do Narcan trainings there. So we do rapid tests, we do Narcan trainings, we hand out a bunch of fentanyl test strips. We recently have been providing hair color and like nail polish and things of that sort. Because again, if you can meet people where they're at, respect them, like hand a little love out. We always like to say that we're just your friendly neighborhood love dealers. Um, you know, it goes a long way with people because that's your end to start talking about, hey, is there anything else, you know, going on? Do you want to get your blood pressure checked while you're here? So it's very much, it's exciting when a health professional has acknowledged all of you, right? Not just a part of you, but, you know, acknowledges that you might be gender diverse or, you know, that, your sexuality is maybe different than the normal or that you're a different race, you know, because a lot of those really do play a big part in your health. I don't know if anyone has heard of the social determinants of health, social determinants of health, anybody. So these are things which we kind of talked about earlier, right? Is this access to food and uh, language barriers and housing and things of that sort. But these play a really big role in different marginalized communities, as one could imagine. Um, so we just, we try really hard to think of the whole person. And so I'm, I'm excited. We uh, give some talks on gender affirming care on the street medicine setting. Um, just a little plug for the USC street med conference. That's going to be in August um, down in LA. If anyone wants to go to that as well. Um, what else? Does anyone want to say anything else? I would say that the, um... living on the street is often in itself traumatic um, and Having substance use disorder often can be a result of trauma or and also lead to trauma for people um, when disinhibited or maybe they've done something or hurt somebody. So trauma-informed care is very important. I want you guys to, if you're going into nursing or into something else, anything where you're going to be in interacting with public, maybe a social worker, have uh, the idea of trauma-informed care. You may look it up. And that's really, in your approach to people, being sensitive to the idea that a lot of people have experienced, in fact, we even say addiction often is the manifestation of childhood trauma for a lot of people. And going in with that um, understanding, being sensitive, not making somebody relive their trauma, but um, having that understanding and going in on how you ask questions, how you approach. You always ask permission. If you're gonna be a nurse, before you do something, you say, would it be okay if I listen to your heart? Would it be okay if I examine your thyroid? Somebody might have been choked. Mm -hmm. I'd like to do this from the, I'd like to examine your thyroid right from standing in front of you. Is that okay? And they can say no. And you can say, okay, right? I ask permission to ask questions. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask a little bit about your sexual practices. Is that okay? That gives people power when they've often felt powerless. That's trauma-informed history taking, trauma-informed exam, and trauma-informed care in general. And I, if there's another thing I want you to take away from that, that's really important here because there is generational trauma that comes uh, 
just out of poverty a lot of times as well. And so people have experienced a lot of that. So being very, very careful and cognizant of that is important. Make me cry. It's like this guy. <laughs> so well this guy. So just a little bit of more sort of uh, things that we do in the community. Uh, this here at the bottom left is actually a resident physician uh, of ours over the family medicine program. And this is us actually uh, providing education to the OBGYNs and the labor and delivery nurses at Doctors Medical Center. You can only imagine how many patients come in to Doctors Medical Center pregnant with a substance use disorder and maybe aren't treated quite uh, as well as we, we would hope. And so we were very excited that the OBGYNs and the nursing staff were proactive. They wanted us to come and teach them. So we designed this entire sort of handbook about how to treat people with a substance use disorder, all the way from managing withdrawal. So using methadone, using suboxone, using other opioids to manage withdrawal so that patients can stay and get care. Uh, so that is something that's really great because, you know, we're able to talk to different groups of people, different providers. This is considered new medicine in the Valley. You know, there aren't many addiction specialists in the Valley. So there's two. There's two. In, in the Valley, the whole Valley. Mm -hmm. um, we're both very busy right now. <laughs> so it is actually the back of Pride. It is the back of the Pride Center. Another resident came out and uh, we were doing phlebotomy and we didn't have any patients coming through. I was like, oh man, because it was raining that day. And so I was like, dude, you could just take my blood. So he just like, you know, rolled up my sleeve and he practiced doing phlebotomy on me. And that's what I was mentioning is sort of some of our harm reduction services we do at Mo Pride. We have another really cool workshop coming up. Uh, it's a, is that, has anyone heard of Cochina Rude? The like amazing drag queen from San Francisco who like specializes in harm reduction. Don't be afraid to raise your hand. Yeah, she is <laughs> so fabulous, but she's going to be coming out and doing an Narcan training, and we're going to be providing all the Narcan for that. Um, check us out on in, on our Instagram. Training here. We could do that. We could do that for sure. But just again, you know, just you know, we're trying to get out there. We're we're, we're really trying to you know be involved whenever there's people that are marginalized or using substances. If we can be of any help. So question four, um, this is actually, so has anyone heard of the, the airport district? Yeah, okay. It is the place with the highest rates of overdose deaths in the entire county is in the airport district. There's this tiny little church and it's called the Rock Church. Has anyone heard of the Rock Church? Oh, the Rock Church. I feel like I needed to know about this years ago. So they serve beautiful groceries to people from like Trader Joe's, Safeway, five days a week. And they've been doing this for 13 years. So this is our newest street med project is that we post up at the Rock Church every Friday. They set up tents for us. I mean, tables, they just, they treat us like we're kings and queens and it's incredible. And we essentially do medical care and we hand out all of our harm reduction supplies, including the most Narcan um, that the airport district has ever seen. So I'm we'll be really curious to know if we can improve some of these rates of overdose deaths. Um, but the Rock Church donated this, what is actually, I think, an old ice cream truck to us. And so this is like our little unit where if we have sensitive exams to do, like breast exams, eventually pap smears out of that. And uh, they deliver, they, they just donated that to us. It was so incredible. But I put these pictures on here for a reason. So this, this question, I'm just going to say it out loud, which is in what ways do you involve peer support and community engagement and your approach to addiction medicine and harm reduction? So we mentioned the substance use navigator at Doctors Medical Center who does the clinic. She's at the top right. That's Lauren. So, you know, you don't want to come into a community and just start steamrolling like, hey, I'm this expert, you know. I'm here to tell everyone what to do. You know, that was never the plan. So it's linking up with people already doing the work. So Lauren, perfect example. Alexa, perfect example. But these gentlemen down here, has anyone heard of the Modesto Needle Exchange? This was the first needle exchange. It was 20 years ago and 15, the Modesto Needle Exchange. And the bottom right person here is Brian Robinson. And he was criminalized for starting a needle exchange. So we could potentially, you know, if it was 15 years ago, we'd be thrown in jail as well and our program would be stopped. He kept fighting back, you know, fighting all these charges, but eventually had to just disband, disband the entire program uh, because he was getting charged with misdemeanor charges and they were harassing him and his patients. So we have connected with him and he comes out and does the work with us now. 
Uh, he comes and he makes kits with us. So to involve people is so, so important because they have, you know, incredible insight from doing this work for so long. And then the person next to him is Diego. And he started like a smaller harm reduction program up at the St. Francis Church in Riverbank. So we're getting people together. You know, it's not that we think we should be the only you know, harm reduction program, we actually need more and more and more harm reduction programs and then come together and support. And the woman in the middle is Lori. She is lovely, a person with lived experience, um, helps manage the residential program at the Rock Church for the women and has connected us to the people that live on Angle Lane. Angle Lane is like a, you know, a developing country. There are 12 homes. None of them have electricity nor running water. There are families, children, animals that live back there. We finally, after weeks and weeks and weeks of going to the Rock Church, have built enough rapport to be walked back to those homes and start taking care of people. And so you have to have these community health workers. You have to have these people that are going to give you warm handoffs in order to really meet people and, and they can feel safe. So that's why I put this up here. And that's really how we involve the community and peer support in the work that we do is finding the people that are already doing it and empowering them. We would really love to pay them for their work. And that is absolutely something, you know, that we're planning uh, because we just find them completely invaluable. Okay, couldn't help myself. I did another Dr. Martin Luther King uh, Jr. quote, which is, I've decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. Uh, and this is the last question, um, which is, which I think is a, an important one, um, which is, and I think maybe to an extent we have, we have talked about this, but in what ways does stigma and failed drug policy affect access to treatment and harm reduction services? In what ways does failed drug policy? Have people heard of, you know, like failed drug policy or the war on drugs? Does anyone know what the war on drugs is? Does anyone want to go out on a limb and try to explain it? Yes. It started by Nixon and it was a war to basically stop the drugs from Mexico and come to the United States. Well said. Good old Nixon. That's exactly that's exactly right. And it was targeting specific groups of people. Yes. Nancy Reagan. Nancy Reagan. Nancy Reagan. And Nancy Reagan continued it. Exactly. Another hand. Did you want to add something to that? Exactly. The black people and the hippies. I have it on here. This is actually evidence that the war on drugs existed. So what I will, this is, this is just, you guys just nailed this. So I will read this aloud. This is a real a memo by the Nixon campaign during his administration. So the Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left, also known as hippies, and black people. You understand what I'm saying. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. That is the war on drugs. Is that news to you? She looks shocked. <laughs> yeah. Is that news to you all? Did you all know this happened in America? Yeah. Some of you do. You guys are smarter than I am when I was your age because I grew up mm -hmm. in somewhere else. There's other really there, there's other really good examples of this. You know, when you start breaking down cocaine into powdered form versus crystal or crack cocaine form of cocaine, the amount of powdered co cocaine that someone needs to get, you know, say 10 years in prison is a lot more needed versus someone who uses crack cocaine. And the reason is because there's discrepancies and the type and, and sort of generally who's using these substances. So, you know, during the crack cocaine epidemic, you find a lot of people of color were using crack cocaine. And so again, if you make it a very small amount that you need to spend all this time in prison compared to the rich white men on Wall Street using powdered cocaine, that's again, failed drug policy that is just perpetuating the war on drugs. So I wanted to make that super clear because a lot of our work has to do with advocacy and education. And I, I think that without talking about that, we would be we would be doing that an injustice. 
So we're coming around the corner here. We're like just a few minutes left. So we always like to thank our colleagues, our advocates, but every talk we do is really thanking our patients. I think next time we'd love to have one of our clients up here with us to kind of give their side of things, but they teach us something every day. You know, um, I've, a lot of us have different lived experience and we won't get into that, but, um, but our patients are the one that teaches us and we could absolutely not do this work without, without them. So please reach out to us, join the movement, right? The social justice movement. Um, you can connect with us. We've got an Instagram. You can go to, you know, just our ACE Foundation website as well, but we'd love to hear from you if you you know, want us to come do any kind of training for you, even just a family member, or you need any kind of supplies. Again, the Coachella plug, it's coming up. So, you know, fentanyl test strips, any kind of, um, I mean, condoms, we got it all. So just reach out to us. We would be happy to give you those items in a very discreet package um, so that you can have a safe time. So we're happy to take any questions, but thank you guys so much for allowing us to speak with you today. Five minutes.